Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TimingResearch.com Crowd Forecast News, episode number 288 for January 25th, 2021. We are recording this at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of TimingResearch.com. And uh, today we're going to be uh, talking about the S&P 500 and other uh, other things going on in the markets. You should be seeing my screen. I'm going to show charts for whatever, uh, you know, everything we end up talking about today. And today I've arranged for Michael Filigera and Eric Gebhardt to join us as the guests. And Jim, the option professor, will be moderating. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Okay. Thanks, David. And thanks, everybody, for being here on a Monday morning here in the West and Monday afternoon on the East. Uh, we've got two very experienced, intelligent guys here who are going to have a lot to say on a lot of different things. So let's introduce them and uh, get going. Uh, first gentleman up is going to be uh, Eric Gebhardt of AltaVest. Eric, uh, for the people who are not aware of uh, yourself or AltaVest, can you give a little background and um, a little introduction? Sure thing. Absolutely. Well, we've been trading since 1997, and I've been actually in the business since 1991. So um, it's hard to believe that I actually have to, you know, say uh, 30 years. So yeah, it's been a long time and uh, it doesn't feel like it though. And, you know, we developed some technology to help us trade uh, options. When I say brokerage firm, we're in the futures industry. So we're only trading futures and futures options. And in particular, we developed some technology a few years back. Um, and just a little background, we had a large client base that we worked with and developed uh, over years trading S&P 500 options. And then the E-mini came out. So we really focused on that. A lot more granularity on the mini contract. It's a little more, uh, it's a more bite-sized piece for, for clients to trade. But nonetheless, so we're trading on really the E-mini complex of futures options is really our focus. We have some technology to help uh, build trades for us. We use algorithms to kind of create those option spreads. We have a lot of non-directional strategies and directional as well, but uh, we like to try to collect premium when we can. And beyond that, we do some automated systems as well, some algo trading systems across about, um, well, really any of the major futures uh, markets, you know, traditional commodities, you know, grains, oils, currencies, futures indices, you name it. So that's what we're doing. Sounds good. And there's a lot to un unpack here today. So uh, let's get uh, Michael introduced and then we'll get right into it. Uh, the next uh, guest is uh, Michael Filigari of Logical Signals. Michael, uh, for the, those who have not uh, been familiar with yourself, a little background on yourself and what's going on at Logical Signals. Sure. <clears throat> My name is Michael Filigari. I started as an options market maker uh, back in the Stone Age at 1979. And uh, I have traded here in San Francisco. I've traded on the London traded options market. I've traded on the European option exchange in Amsterdam. I've traded on the DTB in Germany, where I got my first introduction to electronic trading uh, through the DTB. Uh, came back to San Francisco and again, went back down to the Pacific exchange. And then at, with the advent of everything going electronic, I uh, left the floor, sold my seat, came and started here at home, uh, but continued to trade. I have moved over to trading futures. Uh, that was about 2013. I made that switch over and have been pretty satisfied with just trading futures. And now I am strictly a day trader uh, as far as like coming in and out every day. And uh, I do hold um, actually just one core position now, and that happens to be in gold. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into some of this stuff. Uh, our first question. So we have a couple of questions we talk about uh, on a Monday. Uh, it's a best guess type situation. And it's regarding uh, where the S&P might be closing on Friday from today's opening. Now, today we opened at 3851 on the SPX. It obviously traded quite a bit lower than has come back a bit. But we're going to use 3851, the open, as the, uh, as the water line. And uh, Eric, uh, where do you think we might close uh, by the end of the week? And what do you think your, uh, you know, confidence level is on a percentage basis? Sure. Uh, we're looking at a higher close. I don't think we're in a position now, based on what we look at and some of what we do with our process, I don't think we're in a position to try to pick a top here. So uh, I'd like to say, 
on the SPX, uh, 3870 would be a good target for us. And uh, in terms of a confidence, uh, boy, that's a tricky question. But, uh, you know, looking just as um, past as prologue, as they say, and looking at the trend and uh, certainly in the last uh, few months of, of trend here is really any kind of dip seems to be bought uh, with almost, I don't know, should I say reckless abandon or maybe that's that's the smart money. I don't know, <laughs> but it's working. So uh, I don't know, let's, let's say 60%. Confidence okay. on that. Sounds good. A little bit uh, more, a little more probable than not. Right. Yeah. Okay. And um, Michael, how do you feel about uh, uh, SPX 3851 this morning and where it's going to be on Friday? Um, <clears throat> I feel pretty good about being 3851 this morning. Um, but I, I am going to say lower uh, than 3851 on Friday. Uh, and, and like Eric, I really don't want to go above 60% probability. Okay, well, you got divergent uh, views there, and we're going to see a little bit now uh, what's behind the curtain on where your opinions come from on this uh, best guess. So, Eric, uh, what type of things do you think are going to happen this week that would uh, make your guess uh, materialize? Well, you know, there are a million different narratives, I guess, and you can kind of uh, kind of uh, get dizzy, you know, reading all the headlines and the narratives and the rationale or let's say excuses maybe for why, you know, a market is here or why it should be there and whatnot. But there is, there is a lot on the calendar this week. I mean, you have uh, some of the, the big tech earnings, you have GDP, you've got the Fed. Um, but I suspect that's already, you know, one of those things discounted is, is my guess. And uh, it just seems to me that uh, even politically speaking, um, you know, you have more stimulus checks, perhaps on the way, perhaps not, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, 1.9 trillion, perhaps not, uh, you know, I mean, you can go in circles on this whole thing, but, uh, you know, ultimately the market is just fueled right now with liquidity. And I think mm -hmm. that's really the, uh, you know, the landscape that we have to live with and, you know, it'd be difficult. I was just noticing that, um, was it GameStop? Yeah, uh, you know, you, you, maybe you guys can talk more about that. I don't, we don't trade individual equities and I don't follow no. it too much. But uh, and there was a couple other issues as well, something like uh, fizz. And I, I had no idea what that is. But yeah, there you, there you go. Um, yeah. I was going to get into I, this. I was going to yeah. get into a couple of things like this a little later. Uh, then so I'll punt on that. Yeah. yeah. So but I just go. wanted to get the idea of what's behind the curtain. So you're thinking that the mm -hmm. earning uh, at the end of the day, you're thinking the obviously liquidity that's already out there. And the uh, and the uh, reports may uh, be more positive than not, and ergo, uh, you know, the path of least resistance has been up, and you think it may continue through Friday. Yeah, I think it's really that simple. I think it's just more of the same, and that's uh, a a trend. It's sort of hard to, uh, to you know, step in front of a, a freight train. Exactly. Try now to, here's you know, a, here's a, a good a here's a good question for you though is is that are there any lines in the sand that you would find troubling like today we went down to around 3800 we held there and now we're back up uh, are there any lines in the sand that would change your tune on it uh, you know as far as uh, if we didn't go up and we started actually rolling over where any concerning levels for you well you know some of uh, what we look at uh, just on a short term basis yeah. kind of looking at the uh, you know, kind of a trade versus trend type of thing. I'd say 3750. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good number. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Michael, over to you. Uh, we are looking at you thinking it might go a little bit lower this week. Uh, uh, what's the reasoning behind that? Um, well, for those who don't know me, I am an Elliott Wave analyst as well, and, and uh, Fibonacci I use religiously. And I've been just kind of tracking the rally and it is kind of forming it's it's forming what i would call it, it its final fifth wave up and it's been doing that for quite some time now but since actually september of last year and i start to notice a couple of things like one and one thing that i notice is that the market starts to get thin so we're pushing higher on lower volume and that you know the volume really picks up when when large players or just players are deciding, okay, that's high enough. I'm going to take my profit and they start rolling out of things. Um, so 
I, I do believe we are due for a little bit larger correction than what we've seen so far. There are a lot of things that continue to hold it higher, uh, but I think that just the weight of holding um, the positions themselves uh, may start to, to pull it lower. Now, I'm not looking for anything massive. So I also use moving averages pretty much. So line in the sand, I liked 37.50 as Eric said, but I'm a little bit higher in saying 37.75. Yeah. And a definitive break below 3,700 would start pushing this uh, on a daily chart, would start pushing it down towards the 200 day moving average, the 50 day moving, well, the 50 day moving average is at 3,690 on the daily. Now, of course, that moves as the market moves, but that would be kind of a line in the sand. Um, and then 3,400 comes into play, which is where the 200 day moving average kind of crosses over. I think ultimately as this thing rolls out over the next several months, so I'm kind of looking for a correction that may take us some time um, and be filled with lots of trading opportunities, both long and short. Uh, but I think ultimately we're just setting the stage for a pullback, which might bring us back more into the reality of what's actually happening to the underlying economy, not just the, uh, the economy of tech stocks. Um, but what could kick it off? Uh, like Eric mentioned, we, we have Apple reporting on Wednesday, Amazon reports this week. Those are two big, big major players in all the indexes now. So uh, if they even hint at disappointing, which at this point, the way that they're buying these stocks, I don't think they're believing they're not, but who knows? And so there are a lot of catalysts that can start clicking things over. And I think more importantly for me is that Doing the type of trading that I do, I don't really put an emphasis on whether the market's going to go up or down because right. you, you can make money no matter what happens in the market. And you're good, doing a lot of shorter time frames, aren't you? Um, yes. A long term yeah. trade for me as a day trader is about two yeah. and a half minutes. There you go. So it's a, you know, your time frames on your particular activities is not right. having anything to do right. with Friday. And, and the ability um, to really make some decent money, it, it's still there, it exists, and it's great. Let's show uh, the people, because we are going to talk about the commodity sector, but uh, let's talk about these five stocks that went nuts uh, and then they reversed. And it's just uh, the first one would be um, uh, GameStop. So that's GME. And uh, see if there's anything. I mean, look at it. A... Yeah. That reminds me of Kodak from a few months ago, right? Where it goes yeah. from $1.50 to 60 and now it's trading at 9 <laughs> But... Uh, I don't think there's that much that we can really add to this. The, uh, uh, the, um, the other, uh, let's just look at the chart so people can at least see what's uh, going on there. Um, the next one uh, is uh, Macy's. Macy's went a little bit nuts. The other ones are retailers. M -A, just M, just M, yeah, just M. And that's another one that went way up and now it's back down a little bit. Yeah. So uh, another one uh, that has gone DDS is Dillard's. I guess people got up and uh, wanted to buy, uh, they want to go shopping because uh, there's one that went to 96, back to 84. Another one is uh, 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 Nordstrom, JWN. And another one. And then the last one I was seeing was Blackberry, BB. Blackberry. That's another one. That's yeah. a blast from the past. Yeah. So that gives you an idea of some of the wildness that's gone on here in the first few hours of uh, Monday this week. And uh, um, looks like there's some short squeezing possibly going on and a lot of other things they'll probably look into as well, like the people who are buying a ton of options before this happened, right? But uh, let's turn towards uh, the commodity sector a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of them ha rolled over a little bit, Eric. You know, we had a good correction in grains. We got a good correction in uh, metals a little bit. Uh, a little bit of a correction in, um, in oil. Um, let's take a look first at the, um, at the soybeans, just to get an idea there, because obviously they've been going great, and then they had a, a big drop, and now today they're up 35. Does it look like the correction might be over uh, when it went down towards 13, or what does it look like here? The news is, seems to be tugging between Argentina and China buying and things like that. Yeah, well, you know, I think that, um, 
you know, the, the rally in, in beans and say corn, for example, yeah. uh, seems to, I, I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like it really um, caught a lot of traders uh, off guard, or maybe it's just not making headlines like it used to uh, 20 years ago between, you know, before all of the, um, oh, I guess you could say the, uh, well, I don't know, maybe that's not true. 20 years ago, you had uh, the, the dot-com era, right? And now right. you've got sort of the big tech era making headlines, but um, I don't know. It seemed to be a stealth rally, but an enormous rally, really, in um, mm -hmm. soybeans. I can recall even, was it even maybe 30 years ago, there was, uh, you know, they would comment on beans to the teens. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we We're haven't here. seen we haven't seen that in a while, but here right. we are. And, and even, even corn, but, uh, you know, you kind of have this uh, commodity cycle uh, mm -hmm. in general, this sort of this cycle rally going on. And, you know, in, in part, the dollar is a, a big portion of that too, looking at the U.S. dollar index. So, I don't know. I think that uh, if you follow the dollar and you get the dollar uh, nailed down, then perhaps you're going to be able to uh, navigate a little bit better on some of these other more traditional commodity markets. But, uh, you know, you might have a, a bit of a... The bottom there for the for the moment at least on a looks like maybe a little bit of a uh, inverted head and shoulders in the last couple of months here building on the dollar index but you know yeah. still the trend is heavily down so um you know even these uh these higher lows seem to be getting sold so uh if that's the case then something like beans and corn um should remain elevated and you know you probably want to buy the you know buy the pullbacks and uh, possibly the supplies have been tightened up because of the COVID thing as well. Right. And uh, that's another factor. But uh, in a very short term here, it looks like uh, people might be a little overcrowding the sell the dollar trade. And that's one of the reasons I think that it probably lost some altitude, right? Because the dollar has uh, firmed up a bit. And right, course, right. And of course, when you've gone from $8 beans to f uh, $15 beans in a short time, and the dollar firms up a little bit, that's plenty enough reason for some people to take some uh, money off the table, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly would. And, you know, part of what we do with our commodity side is, you know, we do have clients that are trading uh, more in the traditional sense, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, they're looking at chart patterns or maybe they're fundamental traders. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of what we're doing also is algorithmic driven. And so, you know, the systems could care less about the narratives and right. uh, you know, so it, it's uh, it's just one of those things where maybe um, sometimes the smartest move is to uh, you know kind of uh, fade your feelings, mm -hmm. <laughs> as they say. Right. It's hard to do, but that's uh, partly why we use some of the the uh, algo driven systems is because uh, it's difficult as humans to uh, you know we we sometimes let our feelings get in the way of our success. So yeah. Well, Michael, you uh, are uh, generally uh, following all these things, but uh, of course you follow the gold quite a bit. We've talked about gold since it was at uh, 1100, 1200, 1400, how it was going to go way up, and it certainly did that. But uh, I think uh, when it hit 2100 there, it was kind of uh, a little bit ridiculously extended from its moving averages. So all this stuff after 2100 is not that surprising because, you know, it's basically consolidating a, a parabolic move. But uh, now that it's come back to 1800, 1850, um, it's kind of in a little bit of a crunch time because if you, if you blew out this 1800, 1775 area, you open the door for uh, 15, 1600 or something like that maybe. So yeah. what, are, what are you thinking here? Is it gonna hold its water, get above 1950 and start taking us north? Uh, or do you think it could be between now and the middle of the year, a little bit uh, back and forth and then maybe at the second half of the year, it gets on a bicycle? I kind of, I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Right now, I mean, I'm looking at the daily chart in gold, which I normally will use even for, you know, day-to-day -day trading. Um, and it's stuck between the 200 on the bottom and the 50 on the top, these moving averages. And that is containing it. And that's not unusual for gold because it does tend to follow moving averages very nicely. Um, I think even in the short term, you know, the next month or two, it could pop itself back towards 1900. And what is going to keep the lid on this thing is the fact that, you know, I also was just looking at the 30 year bond and it's rallied quite nicely today. It's up, it's up a full point, uh, which is pretty big for the bonds. And, but it looks like it's nothing more than just 
a little bounce within an ongoing decline in uh, bond prices, and which would suggest yields going up. And as we know, the traders really think higher yields, you're going to hit gold. So I think that, that we've got both things at play be, because we have a lot of uncertainty. And as I've mentioned before, uh, gold hates uncertainty, period, end of story. They just don't like it. And if things are too uncertain, they're going to pump the price of gold higher. Um, <clears throat> but what even will keep a cap on that is if rates continue to rise, then you know we've got the Fed trying to come in and fight that. They're trying to hold things down. We need to keep money cheap because we're looking for a very large uh, stimulus package. So there's a lot of pulling pulling tugging and uh, going on with i think gold and commodities because so much of their movements are based on a mo like eric mentioned and you mentioned jim they're based on the dollar the movement in the dollar um because this is what these things settle into and because they're international products you know a movement in the dollar is going to really affect where these prices end up but i I think it's going to pretty much remain sideways. And like you said, Jim, it might take until mid-year before we yeah. really see that it's okay, it's ready to now make its next move. Well, you Which, follow the Elliott wave, so let me throw this out at you. From sure. what I've been hearing from the Elliott waivers uh, is that, uh, that the gold, you know, may hit some kind of a low in February and then be able to hang around. But sometime after July, the CPI numbers are going to start picking up quite a bit. Right. And the negative real yields are going to be real problematic. And then the dollar may resume a downtrend. And so you could get a big inflation scare in the second half of the year. And that's going to make the gold really, really go. Do you, is that what you're seeing on your Elliott wave tea leaves? Or what do you think? <laughs> yes, uh, more or less. Yes, I agree. I think that off of that high, just you know, below 2100, as you mentioned, it is doing more prolonged so in other words, it's going to burn up more time than actually price. And so it's, it's a more complex corrective pattern. Um, I had thought that it was done um, on that low that we saw last November um, at uh, about 1765, I guess yeah, it was. 1670, yeah. 1767. Yeah, right and, right. But the, the pattern right off of it did not end up being a five. It ended up being a three which is more suggested that we got another five down to do. And then maybe if it's not a five, then it's another three down, five up, and then down. Because we still, I don't think, have finished that larger corrective move if it's going to turn into what we would call a double ABC uh, pattern. So Elliot's kind of out there, and it's telling to proceed with caution, but to stick to the short term and don't try to put on a long term playing gold right now. Um, do you think 1760 you is a safe number, or do you think it's possible we, we take that out before? No, you think I think that we could take it out. Are you, I, okay. So you think they're going to shake the boat up pretty hard, and then it'll be a better market in the second half? Yeah, I do. And, and gold traders are, you, you hit it right on the head, gold traders are famous for shaking them out. What about GDX? Let's throw GDX up there for people who are interested in gold uh, stocks. I think that that because you know that's at a that seems to be deteriorating a little bit. Yes, and the thing about GDX is that we have to remember that these are the miners, and right. so when you're going in thinking that well Newmont's a good price or some of the smaller mining companies are oh that's a really cheap price, remember that it's cheap usually because the cost their cost to get that gold out of the ground. And so you always check with the company, you'll find it in a prospectus or you'll find it on a website or in their earnings reports of what their cost per ounce to get gold out of the ground. So that can propel a rally actually because in gold, but not in the miners because the miners aren't making any money. The other thing I have always found interesting with the miners versus the gold is that the um, miners never went anywhere near their highs. If we can go back uh, right. 10 years on this graph. Right. Uh, they never went anywhere near their 2012 highs. And uh, so I've always felt that uh, this is either a bargain or it's a tell, you know, if it's yeah. a tell, if it's a tell, it's uh, telling us that this move in gold may not be sustainable. And if it's a bargain, then, you know, it's got a lot of runway. 
Well, here's the thing I would balance that against, Jim. I, you know, I pulled up my weekly on GDX and you see the last time that it dealt, we, we had a hard smack because of the, the first wave of coronavirus, this, the GDX just sank, sank right, died. And then it's made a beautiful recovery off of that. I mean, it's doubled, it's almost uh, tripled in, in what it's recovery, but then it stalls and now it starts to come down again. Again, we need to keep our eyes on, I've got the, on a monthly chart, I've got the 20 and the 200 meeting up. So for me, the, the fact that the 200 is sitting still so high at about 32, I'm gonna say, it just, that's it, not a nice picture. It's not lined up to make a stronger move up. It's more in line to drop, to drop. And if the 20 then drops below the 200 and then the four and the eight start to drop below that on a monthly basis, it's not gonna be pretty. We are going to continue to see downside. Now, Actually, the 200, uh, the 50 days under the 200 on GDX. Right, right. So I'm talking about the 20, which is sitting just above it. Yeah. And then the there's, really there's a lot of uh, congestion around this 35, 37 number. Huh? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Correct. So um, and, and I'd like to let me let me throw something over to Eric real quick. Eric, do you follow the silver? Yeah, we follow silver sort of uh, in a similar manner to to gold. Uh, I'm not looking at GDX necessarily, but um, well, I'm just saying that's, you a, you know, that's a, like an indicator of what gold stocks are doing. You know, it's a basket, you know? Yeah, certainly we can look at a silver chart if we want to yeah. pull that up. But, you know, looking at, you know, looking at gold, you pulled up, uh, you know, gold just a few minutes ago too. You just see that uh, series of lower and lower highs since we had that um, what, what was the high, like 1,200? Um, I forget exactly what it was, but- It was 2,090. Uh, or 2,000, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, you have, you know, since then, I mean, it's been several months now, and you know, I don't know, I think that uh, recent low is probably gonna get broken on mm -hmm. gold, just like you, you gentlemen were, were chatting about. But um, anyway, so you're looking here at a, a weekly on silver. Is that a weekly? Uh, can't quite tell if that's a daily or weekly chart. Yeah, it's, uh, I have weekly right now. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, once again, I guess, um, I, th I think we can be set up for, you know, a test of, uh, you know, testing below 20, really. Um, you have this consolidation, and the longer the consolidation occurs, you know, I think that uh, the lesser the chances or odds of a, uh, of a break to new highs. And, you know, I think you also have to look at what's happening with, uh, you kind of touched on it earlier. Um, I forget which gentleman was chatting, like, uh, but on looking at yields and, you know, bond yields, looking at like, say, even like the 10 year, for example, you know, that's, uh, it's up above 1% now. And that was sort of, um, uh, I, I guess, you know, harbinger, so to speak, from several of these uh, analysts that would look at that level as being critical. And, you know, really nothing happened. Stocks kept going up. And, you know, at some point, though, yields go high enough and they start competing, you know, for capital. And, uh, you know, then you see, you know, stocks selling off. And so in that environment, uh, I don't know, maybe you guys can add some, some more color or flavor. But uh, in that environment, I don't see how gold would do well either. Yeah. You know, on the on the U.S. dollar, you know, when they took away the yield advantage, when they dropped the rates down to zero in March, obviously right. the dollar got nailed because if you take away that yield advantage, it's a very negative thing. But now with the uh, uh, yields rising, as you say, above one percent and almost near two percent on the thirty-year, um, maybe that yield advantage has returned a little bit, and that's why we're not breaking under eighty-eight on the dollar index. We're actually trying to go the other way a bit because what was taken away has now been restored with the yields rising, like you were right. saying. Right. And, you know, I, I would, I would suspect I, I, well, I don't have the, the fine tuned numbers right at my disposal here, but I think on the 10 year, at least, I think somewhere above like 120, 1.2 um, would be a, a new high or new recent high on those yields. And that would be a level to look at if you're just looking at, at yields. If you, if you look at, you know, the, the 10 year yields, if you look at the dollar, then, you know, if you can really uh, navigate the dollar landscape, then, 
you know, a lot of other things tend to fall into place. Uh, there seems to be a, you know, oftentimes a, a pretty high correlation for uh, movement you know, in certain commodities in relation to the to the dollar, whether it's inverse or, you know, uh, related uh, correlation, sometimes it can, um, you know, fade as well. You know, you have like a period of, of uh, a few months where you might have a really strong, you know, 80, 90% correlation uh, versus a couple of particular markets, and then that correlation just fades away. So that's, <laughs> they don't make it easy. <laughs> yeah. Do you um, do you think uh, it's reasonable to say that uh, the most crowded trades out there are, you know, long the metals, short the dollar, and short the bonds? And when trades get that crowded and that that uh, popular, you run the risk of a counter trend move. Yes. Yes. Because it it does seem like you know, it's pretty popular to be negative. It's pretty popular to be negative on the dollar, and you know. Uh, they've sold an awful lot of uh, Canadian maple leaves to people. Yeah, your dish sure did. Yeah, I, so. I agree with you. And I think that that's what people really need to kind of keep an eye on. But again, you know, if you're really, if you're in it for the very long term, yeah, you know, you true. pick your point and you go. But also, I think you have to also include where you're going to get out if you are really convinced that you're wrong and not continue to hold on to things. So if you put the trade on for a specific reason, like you said, Jim, pay attention to it. If, this is, if the sides are getting too big, someone's gonna get shook out. It's just the way markets operate. It's just, cause there's no more room. So they start to shake them out. And- Yep. Before we get into, um, before we get into the S&P and the stock index, which I know Eric uh, you know, is very uh, interested in, um, let's take a look at the soft commodities on uh, coffee and sugar, because uh, sugar has been trying to uh, really get out of the gate. And uh, coffee, of course, uh, can be very volatile under circumstances. Um, do you follow the soft commodities of sugar and coffee very much or not too much, Eric? Yeah, I, um, I do at a distance, but it's not a large part of what we do. But certainly right. if you want to put a chart up, um, yeah, I might have 10 seconds worth of thoughts on it <laughs> before yeah, yeah, I run yeah. out of something. <laughs> right. Chart speaks for itself too. Yeah, there, there you go. Yep, we're now 16, up near 16. Yeah, there we mm -hmm. go. Yeah, I wouldn't, you know, once again, I think uh, just looking at that graph, you're going to have a lot of, uh, probably a lot of support at 15 and a half. But, um, you know, I'd have to look at some other, I like to look at some of the various uh, oscillators and indicators in relation to, divergence uh, if there's divergence or not in right. relation to prices yeah when you have that new high if it's not corresponding to a new high in rsi that could be a tell yeah i think that for me i think that's what i that's how i really like to use those types of uh technical indicators best is really in relation to to price and not necessarily in a vacuum but uh so yeah anyway i look at those moving averages we're kind of sitting right on the was that the 20 day or 50 20 day we're right on top of that one right now you know, it's interesting because Goldman is out there talking about this structural bull market that's already begun. Uh, if you could go with like a 10 year graph on sugar and coffee, it'll give you an idea on, um, on why there's some belief that, uh, you know, that things are just beginning. Yeah, there we go. You know, I, I recall, I recall trading sugar when it was, uh, four cents. Yeah, sure. So yeah, yeah, and you know, silver was uh, four dollars. But anyway. maybe the supplies, and maybe with the uh, COVID, the supplies have tightened up on things. You know what I mean? And maybe uh, th there will be kind of like what's happening to those uh, stocks uh, that I, we mentioned in the beginning, where obviously there's some kind of a squeeze going on because people are desperate to buy into GameStop for some reason all of a sudden, or they're desperate to get into Dillard's. What is there a sale on uh, dress shirts or something? Might have been. But uh, you know what I mean? So there's obviously some technical thing going on there with supply and demand. And, uh, you know, uh, commodities supply and demand is a big factor, obviously. And uh, well, is it is it just a harbinger of coming inflation? I mean, you have, I mean, I can't even say the word world record amounts of liquidity. It's beyond that now. I think it's just, right. um, it's monopoly money, really. So right. I know people have been talking about that for many, many years. And, you know, it hasn't happened yet in terms of how that manifests itself, but you know, it will one day it will. And I don't know what it looks like, but 
you know, that's sometimes markets are a leading indicator and certainly, um, you know, knowing what prices can do and, you know, commodities tend to react to those types of things, I think more quickly than not. So be interesting to see what goes on. Uh, Michael, is there any other commodities that you're looking at or is pretty much the gold and silver are the ones you focused on the most and the dollar? Right now, gold, silver, and the bonds. And the bonds. Let's look at TLT real quick, uh, just uh, as a uh, proxy for 20-year uh, instruments. It seems right. like when it broke under 155, 156 there, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of giving you a pretty good uh, give up type a little bit there, because that was the support for a while, you can see, huh? Right, and then it kind of halted, and now it wants to kind of come back. Yeah. Again, um, oops, I lost my screen, but I'll have to use yours, David. There it is. I, um, again, I'm looking at a monthly, and I think that this is just about ready to turn and put in a, a bit of a, or put in some rally, but that doesn't mean it can't drop down. Um, right now it's dropped in, and dropped below the 20 day moving average on a monthly chart and came back and recovered it. So again, your number is gonna become more important, Jim, and that you said uh, 155, but actually 150 is gonna become important because then it's gonna open the door if it drops back below, it's gonna open the door for it to go down to that uh, 50 day moving average on the uh, monthly chart, which sits at 140. Yeah. Now that would say that rates are gonna go through the move no matter what Janet Yellen does or no matter what anybody does. Um, yeah, I mean, people could wake up one day and they don't wanna loan people money for 20 years for 1%. I think that's gonna be the ticket, That you're right. And I think as, as off the cuff as it may sound, that's what people really need to pay attention to. Yeah, Paul Singer of that Elliott uh, company uh, was saying that uh, uh, the uh, bonds are a senseless speculative trade at this point. And I guess what he's saying is, is that, you know, with the potential inflation that's going to be coming, mm -hmm. with the printing that's going on, with the mm -hmm. wage pressures are maybe going on. Yeah. I mean, the likelihood of uh, being able to hold 1% bonds and get away with it, uh, right. that, that door might be closing, right? The door might be closing because we have to kind of keep in focus that to get out of the mess that we're in, we have to print and inflate because we have to stimulate. We've got to shove all this capital out there so that it can be put it back into the economy. And support so, 18 million people that are getting some type of, uh, right. uh, some type of unemployment uh, benefit. Right. And That's so what's it gonna do to the markets? Well, varied things. And, but I think we have to realize what's fluff, what's overdone, what's undercooked and, you know, and then move from there. So you've got to try to, I think, approach the markets from a realistic standpoint. I mean, when we look at like the NASDAQ or even the indexes, it's like, well, what's realistic? Is, is 31,000 in the Dow realistic? It's like, well, it's where it's trading. So you have to say yes, but can it sustain it? Can it hold it up here in confronting what we really need to look at? So I, I think that people get caught up in that, well, the stock market really goes six months out and that's what we're trading. We're trading six months into the future, supposedly. And I don't necessarily want to go with that anymore because six months from now, I don't know. You know, we've got to see what kind of happens as we pull out of this pandemic, as we cap the pandemic, if we can, if we can stop the slide in the economy, if we can start to get things to, to turn by putting money into people's hands so that they can start to rejoin, uh, there's just too many givens not clear yet. Sure. All right, let's turn to the S&P. And uh, Eric, uh, uh, we're currently in the 30, 850 area, I guess. Uh, yeah. But I'm sure what you do, two things are very important. Obviously, price and time, but uh, also uh, the volatility measurement. And that VIX has still been stubbornly above the 20 area. Mm -hmm. Tom Lee of Fundstrat is definitely saying that sometime this year you're going to break the 20 and you might even see 15 handles. Um, and I think if they're correct on the, some of their targets, these big targets of 43 and 4,500 on the S&P, the only way you would get there, I don't, I think, would be to break that uh, fever which is uh, that 20 number on the VIX. But uh, when you're doing your stuff, um, you know, uh, with the uh, strategies you use, uh, are you mostly going with uh, weeklies or monthlies or, 
you know, how far out do you go when you're looking at them and that kind of thing? Sure. Yeah, well, I think it's a fair assessment that, uh, you know, one follows, <clears throat> excuse me, one follows the other in terms of the, you know, the VIX um, and say the S&P um, being inversely correlated. So, it, you know, Tom Lee has been bullish forever and he's been right. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Get a breakdown on the VIX below uh, into the 15 range and you're going to see the S&P. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know exactly where you'll see it, but you'd probably see it at 4,500 or something, I would guess. But, you know, the VIX can also move higher as markets rally too. It just depends on the, uh, you know, that happens on occasion uh, for shorter periods of time. It just depends on how violent those moves are. <laughs> you know, that does happen sometimes. But um, yeah, absolutely. In terms of what we look at, a lot of the uh, trading and the duration we're looking for, I'd say might be 60 days into the future. So we're selling premium that's pretty far out on the curve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, usually well above two uh, standard deviations above and below, you know, some of the, um, um, like say the Bollinger Bands, looking at two standard deviations. And, you know, from there, um, you know, it's really a matter of managing the process and managing your risk mm -hmm. um, day by day. So that's, I think, I think uh, one of you mentioned uh, knowing, essentially knowing where you want out before you get in. I think is what I heard um, in so many words. And I think that's key. And so that's kind of what we do is we have our process in place and we have our risk management. We try to automate that so people don't have to, to kind of babysit and, and, and screen watch. And, you know, I, um, I think there's plenty of people that I've seen some great uh, programs for people doing day trading as well. And it can certainly work. It's just not something uh, that we focus on. We just have kind of a different time frame and, uh, mm -hmm we just approach it a bit differently for our client base. Yeah, I think the concept of uh, uh, the time frame that you're uh, writing them is in the teeth of the Black and Scholes time decay model. So that's gonna be a good thing. And then uh, the two standard deviations keeps the uh, striking prices substantially away from the current level. And then the main right. thing, as you well know, is, is uh, managing uh, volatility when and if it does uh, rear its head, which it could be an 80-20 deal where 80% of the time it doesn't. And how you manage that 20% is going to really dictate how things uh, settle out. Yeah, that's exactly right. Most of the time it's like watching paint dry. Right. And uh, even if the market moves higher over a period of time, you know, over a month or so, if it moves a few percent higher or something or lower even, um, that's really no concern for our positions. So it's it's really those times where you have, um, well, we've had it happen before where you see a melt up, you might see an index that's 10% higher in a month. Right. And and then then you then you you know run into trouble with some of these approaches and some of these uh, strategies. Right. Uh, and then you just have to, uh, you know, have your plan in place ahead of time because you don't want to be sitting there thinking this isn't supposed to have happened. I, could, I can't believe this didn't, you know, work the way I thought it would, or I can't believe it happened like this. I mean, that's not going to help you at that moment. And usually in the, the bullets start flying in battle, that's uh, you have to have your plan. And even then your best of plans can get uh, sidelined easily by emotion. So we try to, we try to automate that process and at least encourage people to automate it with our technology. And you also uh, focus a bit on the amount of leverage on uh, on the on the on the account balance, so you don't have too many positions on, because sometimes you'll see the requirements are so low, and uh, maybe uh, you know uh, you could put on uh, ten positions, but maybe three would be better. Yeah, sometimes it looks so easy, you know, yeah. oh, this boy, this is free money. They're just exactly. handing out money and we're going to just load up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's where your uh, discipline would come in. Yeah, so we always size it correctly. And the way we margin position is that uh, the the maximum around, uh, amount of risk on the position is essentially your margin in advance. So you're not going to have margin calls. You're not going to be forced out of a position uh, right. just because of a margin call. You might want to get out of the position for other reasons, risk management, but it won't be due to a margin call. So you're mostly doing spreads. Yeah. Yeah. We're not doing naked options just to clarify. Right. They're covered spreads. So the, the difference between the two strikes minus the credit is really the exposure. Yes, that's yeah. exactly right. Uh, yeah. Usually, well, just to clarify, uh, usually we're looking at the put side of the trade. So if we're doing a non-directional strategy, uh, it's going to be the put side of the trade uh, that is used, you know, the risk on that put um, spread is really the margin, so to speak. 
And have you been primarily working with the puts exclusively or have you gone into the calls too as well? No, no, no. We do uh, certainly both. A lot of times we'll do uh, like a, a variation on an iron condor, something we call a dragonfly that just buys an additional call and put that's closer to the money. Um, so you take a dragonfly essentially and um, you, know, you buy additional insurance is, is really the way we like to say it. And it just costs more money. It lowers your potential return, but it, it does dramatically alter the, the risk reward profile of that position so that you can uh, tend to stay in positions longer that um, otherwise would be under pressure. And do you have kind of a, a return objective or a goal of uh, per annum, uh, 10%, 15%, 25%? What, you know, do you have some kind of an objective? Yep, excellent question. And it really depends on the environment. So uh, a lot of that would depend on maybe where the VIX is. In other words, what's the value in the market? So what right. can we expect realistically to capture? So uh, depending on where we are, let's just say that 20% might be a, um, a round number to start with. Mm -hmm. And from there, if the value is higher, you might, we might be up closer to 30% on some of the, what we call of our, our, our targeted returns. And, um, if it's a lot less than 20%, then, you know, we're, um, you know, really not in the, a ripe environment or mature environment for what we're doing. And so we sort of, uh, yeah. you know, we, we minimize some of the exposure. Uh, we don't want to get caught in a, a volatility spike in that case. Right. So the, uh, the, the premium, obviously the premium levels dictate exactly what kind of cash flow you receive and the cash flow you receive can ultimately dictate what net return you have. Right. That's right. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Michael, with regards to the S and P, are you doing much with it or uh, give us some ideas of uh, some of the sample things that you're trying to do uh, in the markets right now? Sure. Um, as again, in the index, <clears throat> excuse me, in the indexes, I, I am a day trader and my uh, market of choice is the NASDAQ. Uh, the NASDAQ flips and flies and goes in all directions and the volatility remains uh, pretty high. And so are you doing the NASDAQ future like NDX or something or what I'm, are you doing? I'm doing the NQ. NQ. Okay. And, um, it's, and it, you know, it, 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 the, the mini contract is $5 a tick gotcha. and this thing moves in dollars. So it's 20 bucks a point. And, you know, for example, this morning when, when the market started to tick down, I mean, you're putting on maybe two contracts and you're making within, within two minutes, 800 to a thousand dollars, because that's just what the market was doing. Does it happen every day? No. Uh, but you want to be there on the days where, where it does. Um, again, you can get that in both directions. You can get an up move uh, where you know you can put on one, two, or three contracts, and then just peel them off as this thing continues to just move higher, and you can make your money. Um, I also the futures, which would be the Dow, the Russell, the S and P, and the Nasdaq, all have micros now as well. Yeah, I was going to say, are they fairly liquid? Oh my God, yes. And the, let's get an idea here. Like on the S and P E Mini, it's fifty bucks a point. If you do the micro, what is it? Ten? Uh, no, it's it's a buck twenty-five. Uh, a buck twenty-five a tick, so that it's five bucks a point. Okay. So, like uh, to give an instance, if we go from thirty-eight hundred to thirty-seven hundred, which is a hundred points on the E Mini, it's five grand. How much would the micro be? Twelve hundred and fifty. Yeah. So it's a little bit more than 20% uh, uh, of the E-mini. Yeah, and, but the thing is, it's like, again, the mini in the S&P, not, not the big daddy, that's the 25. Well, that's, um, yeah, that's 25 but, grand uh, up 100 points. Yeah. Right, so the mini is $12.50 per tick, four ticks to the dollar. You mean the micro? No. The micro is a dollar twenty-five. Okay, but so, again, just using a number, it's about a little bit uh, more than twenty percent of the E-mini. Um, because like so, you're saying, you're saying a hundred points on the on the micro is uh, twelve hundred and fifty bucks, and a hundred points on the E-mini is five grand, right? No, a hundred points. I mean, a hundred points. You know, yeah, I mean, you're meaning 30, yeah. 3,800 to thirty-nine hundred. Yes. 
So 125 yeah. times four, so it's five bucks times a hundred. Yeah. So yes, you're correct. It's 5,000 versus 50. Yeah. And that's how this works. And it's just like in the NASDAQ, it's 50 cents a tick. Right. So well, anyway, getting back to your getting back to your trading uh, concept, uh, when you go in and uh, like today, it looks like that uh, March uh, NQ opened at 30, 13,370. Um, no, it actually, I think it opened higher. Let me see. Six. It opened just below uh, 13,500. Okay. And then just kind of soared up to the high at 13,554.50, and then just started to come off. Now, I just thought it was going to be just a little pullback uh, coming into support still above 13,500. But then the sellers came in, and which is nothing more than just, you know, I think people just decide, that's it. Oh, I'm fine. I'm getting out. And they're just rolling out of positions. And it, but it drove it down to 13,180 from, so it's $400 move. Right. Basically. $400 move. In, so are you using a moving average or are you using the... Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, moving averages are my best friend okay. in day trading um, because it helps you to kind of, you, you know, the algorithms tend to go towards, depending on direction, they'll go towards um, moving averages. So if it starts to break below, say, for example, breaks below the eight day moving average, it breaks below the 20 then you know it's going to really start heading towards the 50. And that could be a large gap. That could be, you know, 20 or 30 points. And that's worth playing. So, but you also then have to really work out how you want to play it. Do you want to play it with a five lot? Well, nah, that's, that's, you're putting on a lot of risk. So you might build to a five lot and then start to peel it off as it comes down, maybe keeping one to get yourself all the way down and get your maximum profit. So there's just, different techniques that are used and you can put them into place based on what the market is telling you at that particular time. Um, so that's how I prefer to trade is instead of me walking in with an opinion on, well, I don't think it should go there. I think it should go here. And then I'm going to build a long or a short based on that. I'd rather just go, I'm going to let you tell me market and then I will play it accordingly as the market unfolds. So it takes away that decision process of like, I mean, I have a larger picture and I've got a larger, longer term idea of where I think the market's going to go. But on a minute by minute basis, I don't need to worry about that. I'd rather have other market players do that so that I'm in line. And as it breaks a moving average, okay, I'm going to buy it. If it goes above the point of control, hey, that's great. So I can with the moving averages, with value area high, value area low, point of control, I can kind of determine where I think the market's going to go. And then you yeah. also will determine, oh, if it doesn't and it breaks below this moving average, I'm out. Yeah. So I got yeah I'm, just look, I'm just looking at a simple moving average on a day chart, and it gave you a pretty good sell, sell signal, like you say, uh, anything under 13.5. Yeah. And then it went all the way down to 13.2 and then yeah. kind of told you to get out around 13.3. And now it's been telling you to kind of stay in there for a while as yeah. long as it's kind of above 13.4 and or something like and that. And if you can tell, it is consolidating in that upper portion of, of this range off of that low. Yeah. As long as it wants to continue to that, that's telling me it's going to go up yeah. into, the, into the close more than likely. Yeah. It seems like uh, that was a spike down in that. Uh, and now it seems like it's come back. Outside of the um, um, uh, NASDAQ, uh, anything else you're kind of trading on a short-term basis? Um, short-term, depending on what people want to view as short-term, but I still do a lot in gold. And just so people understand, it's like I have been trading gold since the 80s. And it's one of my favorite products, but I'm doing it based on a lot of different reasons. And I had uh, fairly large core positions, which as the market got above 1975 and up to 2000, I had already determined that I was going to roll out of all of that into physical gold. And then I started to move out of the physical gold. So on the, on the day trading like gold today, it looked like it gave a little bit of a sell signal and it broke under about 1860. 
and yep. it went all the way down to 1846 yep. and kind of gave a buy signal at around 1851 or something. Yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of action. Uh, there's a lot of action on these things uh, in her day, huh? And I will, and I will add for you that gold follows Fibonacci intraday very, very cleanly. Okay. So if you know where to draw your Fibonacci lines and, and, and it, it goes to it and comes off of it. Sure. And Fibonacci and gold, it's just the way the algorithms are written, folks. That's, and that's how they play. They're all in there and they usually coincide with the moving averages. And you made some very, those are very nice observations, Jim, yeah. on, hey, it broke this moving average and now it's, it's you know, and what it does. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the chart, the chart speaks it. for themselves, right? All right. Let's, uh, let, yeah, let's uh, button this thing up a little bit, Eric, um, uh, for people who would like to get more information on uh, what you do, which would include obviously some of the writing strategies uh, using limited risk spreads, uh, you know, and other things that you guys are doing at AltaVest. How could they get a hold of you? And, uh, and if you have any special offer, this is a great time to extend it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we do have a trial offer so that you can have a demo to our, what we call Theta Trader software technology. You'll have access to all of the uh, daily Theta trades, which are all the algo driven option spreads. And also we have trade alerts. So they'll, uh, they'll come directly to your phone. You touch the link. And then if you were a client of ours, if you like the trade, you just touch accept or reject. And if you touch accept, then our technology processes everything. So kind of unique in the, trade alert world, typically trade alerts come with an email or text and you have to log into some other platform and, you know, enter all the info yourself. So certainly uh, you can go right to our website, altavest.com. And um, you'll see there the link for the trade alert demo, as well as the Theta Trader demo. And that would be uh, a good start. You'll have access to really what we're doing for the most part. And also we'll kind of get you up to speed on some of the algo trading systems on the futures contracts too. If that's also an interest, we can get you a demo for that too. And you're doing both the uh, self-directed um, uh, relationships as well as uh, assisted relationships. Well, it is self-directed. So, okay. however, uh, just to clarify the theta trader, for example, will push out trades to you and you do have to decide as a client which trade to accept or, or not accept, but mm -hmm. all of the heavy lifting has mostly been done with the trade construction and also the risk management so that once a trade is placed and filled, uh, it will automatically monitor that position and then close it out for you when it reaches a profit or risk target. Hmm, very interesting. Well, people should look into that and see if it's right for them. And uh, that's certainly a unique, uh, I think, in some respects, uh, approach. So that's uh, something to definitely uh, learn more about and see if it's right for them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, yeah. it, it has a place, uh, but it's certainly not for everyone. No, no, but definitely is something to at least be aware of. Um, Michael, um, some of the things that you're doing and how you communicate with people, uh, this would be a good time to explain that a bit. And also, uh, if you have any offer to extend it now, would be a great time too. Okay. Um, people can always get a hold of me by emailing me at michael at logicalsignals.com. Excuse me, that's michael at logicalsignals.com. Uh, currently, I am working with my uh, web person and we're rolling everything into a uh, new website. And that website is www.tradershelpingtraders.com. And I'm kind of really excited about it. And I'm going to be doing two things. So Logical Signals will be under there. And also um, Eye of the Storm, which is one of my other favorite um, websites in terms of um, URL. And what I am going to start doing is uh, daily podcasts about day trading, about you know what we did today, what the markets did today, and then also uh, putting out some analysis written form, but that would be under logical signals. Um, I'm more focused right now on coaching, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I've had trade rooms in the past. They can be very time consuming. They can be very unforgiving. Uh, you get a lot of different types of people that come in, and I, I'm at a point where I just really, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy helping other traders uh, hone in on their skills and develop their own skills and, 
and business plans to make them more successful as individual traders. So that's my key. I'm running towards um, coaching. So if Great. people are interested in coaching, you can write to me. We can set up an appointment. We can discuss it. Uh, but those that are wanting to take coaching with me, I'm offering uh, a discount for um, multiple sessions. Okay. And you've given uh, their, your email so people can reach you by email as well, right? Yes, michael at logicalsignals.com. Okay, great. Hey, uh, guys, I think we went over a lot of information. Uh, you guys are very knowledgeable and experienced, so it's, uh, it's great information to hear. Uh, for those of you who'd like to get the optionprofessor.com weekly market update, which goes over all different markets, uh, simply go to our website, optionprofessor.com, put your email in, and you get it free of charge every Friday. Uh, David, I'm going to send it back to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Eric and uh, Michael, for being here, and uh, good luck and good trading to everybody out there. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, thanks, guys. Great discussion today. So just a quick reminder for everyone listening, be sure sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast app or directory. And you can also go to timingresearch.com to get access to uh, uh, any of the past reports or shows or uh, today's uh, episode as soon as I can get it posted. Um, and uh, oh, uh, be sure to join us tomorrow uh, for uh, Analyze Your Trade at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Carly Garner will be back with us. And you can always access that at timingresearch.com slash live. And uh, I just want to thank my guests again for today. Michael Filigera of uh, his, the new uh, tradershelpingtraders.com site. And uh, Eric Gebhardt of altavest.com. And the option professor of optionprofessor.com. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye-bye.